what does it mean to be Catholic? What do you identify as the Catholic identity versus other Christians? And what does it take to get the Catholic identity back? Hello and welcome to my channel if you're new here and welcome back if you've been here before. If you haven't yet, please click the subscribe button down below and if you could also click the like button, I'd really appreciate that. That tells YouTube that this video is worth watching and YouTube will then also suggest this video to other people that might be interested in it. Now, in this video, I'm going to be reviewing this book, Restoring Our Catholic Identity by Paul Nelson. Now, if you've been following my channel for a while or even if you've just stumbled upon my channel, you may have seen a book review that I've done by him previously and that was Christians Must Reunite, Now is the Time. And that was a good introduction apologetics book that also had his testimony in it and the testimony of his son-in-law. Um, if you haven't read that one yet or seen that video, I'll link that in this video and I do highly recommend that book. Um, I recommended it in that video naturally. Definitely worth reading. So is this one. Now this book covers the things that have progressively been lost in our Catholic identity over time and how to get that back. And he does a good job of identifying things that have crept into our church, um, particularly things that are the result of modernism. Um, the foreword is well written. It's written by Kevin Wells, who is the author of The Priest We Need to Save the Church, which my husband has that book and at some point I might end up reading and reviewing that one as well. Um, this book is highly recommended. It has um, recommendations by Michael Hitchborn um, of the Lepanto Institute and of um, David L. Gray. You may be familiar with um, either or both of them from YouTube. They have really good YouTube channels. And um, I believe they also have um, possibly books out. I know that David L. Gray um, hosts a, a radio show. And like I said, he has a YouTube channel, which I've seen a lot of his videos. When you get into the book, the table of contents goes like this. I always read the table of contents to give you an idea of what you're getting into with the books. The foreword, the introduction, chapter one, when the church changed, chapter two, the post-Vatican II church, chapter three, New Age Catholicism, chapter four, more Catholic no-nos, chapter five, gurus, wayward Catholics follow, chapter six, dissident organizations, chapter seven, where have the Catholic schools gone? Chapter 8, receiving Eucharist in the hand. Chapter 9, new Catholic programs. Chapter 10, where have the beautiful churches gone? Chapter 11, will you be left behind? Chapter 12, marriage, the family, and sexual morality, changing attitudes. Chapter 13, Catholic charismatic renewal. Chapter 14, would Jesus support socialism? Chapter 15, Artificial Insemination, Abortion, and Euthanasia. Chapter 16, A Crisis in the Priesthood. And Chapter 17, Champions of the Faith. Now, to give you an idea, his book starts out with, actually there's the foreword, which kind of goes into part of what Paul wrote about. Paul and his wife had gone to a church. And when they went in, you could hardly tell from the outside that it was a church. And in fact, mass was held in a sort of auditorium looking type of place. The classic folk music guitars, that sort of thing, a band basically performing. And afterwards, he was talking to the deacon about, you know, where's all the stuff that identifies this church as actually being Catholic? You know, the Stations of the Cross, you know, the music, where is what embodies it? The deacon's like, oh, well, the Stations of the Cross are out that door and down that hallway, and the tabernacle's down that hallway, and this door off to the, the left sort of thing. And the deacon mentioned that they did things differently there. And while different can be good in that situation, it wasn't good. And the problem is, is that this church that he went to, this particular parish he visited, it's not alone in being like that. There's actually way too many parishes that are like that, that, that don't embrace the Catholic identity and what makes us Catholic. And sort of hides away our Catholic identity and the faith and Jesus in the tabernacle and 
sort of makes it about us and a party as opposed to worshiping God. And so that's one of the things that he notes in this book, particularly in the, um, jumping ahead a little bit here, in the chapter about where have all the beautiful churches gone. And that's an example of where have they gone. Um, you see more modern-looking churches. But to, to get back to the beginning of the book, um, it talks about when the church changed. And if someone went to sleep in the 60s and woke up in the 70s, would they even recognize the Catholic Church anymore? Um, the, the Mass got changed. He talks about that from the traditional Latin Mass, which is full of reverence to the Novus Ordo Mass, which doesn't have the same the same fullness and the same reverence, I'd say. I grew up in the Novus Ordo, found the traditional Latin Mass as an adult, and I haven't looked back. It's The Novus Ordo is just not quite as full. It's not as fulfilling as the traditional Latin Mass. Now, there's some that are done that are very reverent. Um, I've gone to one of those in Steubenville. But what makes that Novus Ordo Mass in Steubenville so reverent fulfilling is how similar it is to the traditional Latin Mass. And they do have a traditional Latin Mass in that same parish, too. So he goes into the various changes from the post-Vatican II church versus before Vatican II, such as bringing in um, bands, changing the music. Um, as he talks about in Chapter 8, receiving communion in the hand. He also talks about New Age Catholicism. Now, I thought that this was an especially interesting chapter because he brought up things that I wasn't even aware of. Um, he talks about Thomas Merton, a famous Trappist monk, which I have heard of him before. Really wasn't impressed with him as I was reading about him outside of this book even. Um, he seemed kind of off the point in New Age. And when I read that he was heavily influenced by Pierre Tejard de Chardin, I think I got his name right, um, who was a Jesuit priest who believed in the so-called Omega Point. I'm like, oh, it's starting to come together because I've read about that same priest as part of theistic evolution. And so it's like, oh, yeah, I can see where this is you know, headed. Um, so he talks about centering prayer, um, mindfulness, and then he goes into talking about yoga, the Enneagram which I had not even heard about the Enneagram until I read about it in this book. And then I was on Instagram, and a few of the people that I watch on YouTube and I follow them on Instagram were talking about the Enneagram and what their Enneagram number was, and I'm like, wow. So I was really glad that I'd already read about it in this book, so I kind of had a heads up, because these are some people that I like. They call themselves Christians, but they're going off into New Age stuff. And then he talks about energy healing and... He goes into a few other things. He talks about gurus, wayward Catholics follow. And these two chapters really do tie together, but these are things in these two chapters that a lot of Catholics will sort of, they'll rebel against the idea that these are forbidden things, that they are New Age things or even occult things. And I've come across some of these people in Facebook groups where they are very quick to defend um, yoga or Reiki or various things like that saying, oh, well, it's not like that. And the biggest defense I find when people say, oh, well, if you just don't include the spiritual element. And they, they seem to either deny or forget the fact that that spiritual element is inseparable from the practice. It's like yoga, which literally means to yoke yourself. And all the yoga positions are, they are the positions a person contorts their body into that are the same shape as the demon. So basically when you contort your body into those various positions, you're inviting the demon into you. It, it opens you up. And when I was in my teens and early 20s, I did yoga. And then when I found out about this, and when I realized it was that oh no moment where I realized I was partaking in something that I shouldn't have been. And so I completely separated myself from it. And sometimes separating yourself from those things which you shouldn't be involved in, even if you didn't know it at the time, it can be a little painful. But after you do the separation, it's a very liberating feeling. And so, you know, he's talking about, he talked about the mindfulness prayer, 
which has its foundation in Buddhist meditation. If it's not Christian, a Catholic doesn't have any business doing it. So whether it's mindfulness or it's the centering prayer, these things are not Catholic. These things are brought from outside, brought into the church. And the problem is, is that there are a lot of Catholic churches that will bring these things in. Um, he actually names the names of people who were at the root of these things being brought in. He says, in the late 1960s, a fascination with transcendental meditation was all the rage. Rock stars and entertainers were beginning to follow Eastern mystics like Marishi Mahesh Yogi and others who worshipped Sri Krishna, the supreme god, in an effort to achieve the ultimate enlightenment. Disturbingly, some in the Catholic world got caught up in all this. And he talks about the Trappist monk Thomas Merton was in his fascination with Eastern mysticism and meditation. And so, I mean, he really does a thorough background on what each of these things are and why Catholics have no business messing with them and how it's outside of the Catholic Church because our point of being, our point of existing is to worship God, Him. We're supposed to be praying to and centering on Him, not ourselves. We are not God. God is in us in the sense that Jesus is in us, particularly when we receive Holy Communion, but we aren't God. We're supposed to be worshiping Him, not trying to make ourselves God. Um, when he talks about the more Catholic no-nos, such as yoga and the Enneagram, that was a really interesting chapter. Basically, your best bet is to just get this book and read it um, because it has so much information in it. I'll highlight a little bit here about the Enneagram. Some of his information came, for instance, from Father Mitch Pacwa of EWTN. If you've seen EWTN, you've probably seen Father Mitch Pacwa at some point. He's really good. And he was learning about this as a seminarian. And now he's opposed it and written against it. And so in this book, he's talking about how Catholics are using the Enneagram to talk about things like saints and sin and faith and fruits of the Spirit. Using these words makes it sound legitimate. But they're only adapting these terms to the Enneagram by giving them different definitions. So changing the wording on things doesn't make them less bad. It just means that you're trying to rationalize and justify them. He also talks about dissident organizations in Chapter 6, and he includes Richard Rohr's Center for Contemplative Action and the amount of Catholics, and this includes priests, nuns, laity, that have associated themselves with this and gotten sucked into this, or maybe even not gotten sucked into it as a desire to be involved in this sort of thing. And it's not Catholic. He goes over well. Um, his information is evidence to support the fact that Catholics have no business being involved in this sort of thing. He um, lists out the seven core principles that are on their website. And really after reading it, you come out of it going, what? So he, he does an excellent job on that. Um, he talks about where have the Catholic schools gone. And this, I got to say, is so true, because even in the Catholic schools, you're not really, the, I mean, there's, I've heard there's a few out there that are still good, but for the most part, you're not really learning about what it means to be Catholic in them. Um, Catholic schools used to be inexpensive, filled with Catholics, staffed by priests and nuns, and priests and nuns really didn't cost anything, so the tuition was either non-existent or it was very inexpensive. Nowadays, there aren't any priests or nuns or hardly any in the schools teaching the kids. And so they're being taught by secular teachers who may be at best Christian, if anything at all. And these kids are being influenced by these teachers who are, sometimes we hear, not even teaching them Catholic things. Um, there's been fights even over teachers who are in same-sex relationships. And there's a battle over keeping those teachers there as opposed to letting them go. And those teachers are influencing the students and their lifestyle and that their lifestyle is okay. Which is not okay because these students aren't being taught in the Catholic faith. 
And the Catholic faith is the faith given to us by Jesus. And it's true because he's true. And so it talks about how a lot of these schools have basically just become private schools that have the name Catholic to them, even though they really aren't Catholic. And there's not even as many of them as there used to be anymore. But tuition hasn't gone down any by the fact that, you know, there's less students, less, less staff, less faculty at times because of having to let people go because they just can't afford them. So the schools really need to be, they need to be made Catholic again. Um, I know I've heard basically like for universities, Notre Dame isn't Catholic anymore. It may say it's Catholic, but they're really not Catholic anymore. Um, Christendom, I've heard, is excellent. Steubenville is good. Ave Maria in Florida, I've heard. I've heard those are all trustworthy Catholic institutions. And then he covers in chapter 8, receiving the Eucharist in the hand. That was brought to us by Cardinal Bernadine, which if you haven't heard yet, he um, was a pedophile priest and a Satanist, and he brought it in by unscrupulous means. Basically, it kept getting voted down, and he worked to undermine that to get it brought in. It was never supposed to have been brought in. In fact, one paragraph in this chapter goes, As the abuse of communion in the hand increased and would soon begin in a few more countries, Pope Paul VI surveyed all bishops to see where they stood. The overwhelming majority of them rejected communion in the hand. As a result, the Congregation for Divine Worship concluded in a document called Memoriale Domini. From the responses received, it is thus clear that by far the greater number of bishops feel that the present discipline, i.e. communion on the tongue, should not be changed at all. Indeed, if it were changed, this would be offensive to the sensibility and spiritual appreciation of these bishops and of, the most, and of most of the faithful. Now he goes into a paragraph talking about Bernadine here, where it goes, The champion of receiving the Eucharist in the hand in the United States was none other than Archbishop Joseph Bernadine one of the most egregious distorters of the faith within the Catholic Church in the United States. Unbelievably, he was the president of what was then the National Conference of Catholic Bishops. Bernadine attempted several times to obtain the necessary two-thirds majority in favor of distributing communion in the hand, and he failed. Even after he left the top spot, he continued lobbying for the, his position. He worked to get the agreement of retired bishops and others that were absent for the votes. That was against the protocol for obtaining consensus, but that didn't concern him. After strong-arming some and calling in favors from others, he was able to garner the majority vote he needed to institute communion in the hand. He also goes on to talk about new Catholic programs. In this chapter, he talks about some programs that have been brought into the Catholic Church that were never even Catholic to begin with, that started in Protestant churches, and they don't follow along Catholic teaching at all. And it's really sad because then Catholics are being taught this stuff and it's just progressively watering down the faith. Catholics are being badly catechized even today. And if you don't go searching for information and finding out what the Catholic Church teaches, you could get led astray. And the sad part is when it's actually Catholic churches that are holding these programs. And then Catholics think, oh, well, it's being taught at the church. It must be okay. And it's not. And they're not being taught right. And so he covers a lot of that in this particular chapter. Um, like I said, he covers about the churches, the beautiful Catholic churches. Where have they gone? How churches don't look, they don't look like the, the beautiful buildings that were built to ascend to and worship God. They've started looking at times like basic houses or buildings. In fact, when I was in California, I was going to the cathedral there. I drove past it twice before I finally realized that when the GPS said, you are here, that it was on my left. It was this big cement looking building. It looked nothing like a church to me. I had no idea that was a cathedral. I was blown away. So churches really need to start looking like churches again. When you're driving by, it needs to shout out to you, this is a Catholic church and you feel ready to spring into the sign of the cross for going past that tabernacle. Um, in chapter 11, he talks about, will you be left behind? And the whole rapture thing that was started. And... He talks about the whole series Left Behind, and he does a good job of shooting down how not scriptural that whole concept is. And I still see today on Facebook Catholics that will be like, oh, well, you know, there is the whole, the rapture thing. It's like, no, there's the second coming. The rapture is just, 
it's not fame. It's, it's not even scripturally sound. And he actually supports all that um, in this chapter, documenting where it came from, Protestants, and the whole misleading of it in this concept that, you know, Catholics think, oh, well, you know, um, this is, you know, a thing. And even though it was started by a Protestant, there was a Catholic priest, Jesuit, that um, got pulled into it. He goes, the next hint of such a doctrine appears surprisingly enough in the writing of a Chilean Jesuit named Manuel Lacunza. His book, The Coming of Messiah in Glory and Majesty, was published in Spanish in 1812. In this massive volume, Lacunza concluded that toward the end of the world, Jesus would snatch up from the earth the faithful believers who regularly received the Eucharist. Then the Lord would keep them safe for 45 days while terrible judgments chastised the world. Finally, he would appear with them on earth to judge the human race. Anyone who's actually read the Bible knows that's not how it works. I mean, in parable after parable, Jesus talks about how the angels will be sent up. They'll gather up the tares, not the wheat first. They'll gather up the tares, throw them in the furnace, then the harvest of the wheat. So it's, if anyone's left behind, it's the wheat, the, the Catholics, the, the Christians, the followers of Jesus. They will be the ones that are, quote, left behind while he harvests the bad ones and, and throws them into the furnace. So the judgment's going to come on those who are going to hell first. So he covers that really well in here. Um, he, he gives excellent background on pretty much everything he talks about. He does an excellent job of it. He does a good job on marriage, the family, and sexual morality. Um, these whole trial marriages and the fact that, yeah, living together and not being married and living as a married couple, still fornication, still a mortal sin, still not taking you to heaven. Send you the other way. He also talks about how too many people fall into the idea of what modern society says is moral. It's not what God says, and it's wrong. And uh, let's see here. He talks about would Jesus support socialism? No, because socialism... It, and he, he goes into this well. Is the government taking money from people and then just sort of supposedly dispersing it you know, equally? No. Jesus was about giving to those who needed it of your own free will. So those who had more saw people who in need and they gave of what they had. Sometimes, not just their surplus, but what they had in general to the people who needed it. It's not the government being involved and it's not, okay, well, everybody even told. No, it's you see someone in need, you give to your brethren. And brethren doesn't just mean like your blood relative. A fellow Christian is a person in need. In fact, in the early church, the Christians would even take in pagans that were tossed out by their family and fast and sacrifice and take care of them. And that's part of what identified them as being Christians. It's kind of like that, that song where it says, they will know we are Christians by our love. Jesus wasn't a socialist. That's just loving to take care of your neighbor. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan and who your neighbor is. He then addresses artificial insemination, abortion, and euthanasia. I mean, it's kind of easy. There's really no argument there on the error of those things. Artificial insemination breaks what is the marital union. And also, doing artificial insemination requires the mortal sin of masturbation. So, by default, that one's just not okay. Abortion, taking the innocent life of a baby, obviously murder, not okay. Euthanasia, murder just at a different time in a person's life. And then he talks about a crisis in the priesthood. Um, I think I've already talked about that in the book reviews of a few other books. But yeah, he does an excellent job on that. In fact, he highlights how the good priests these days are frequently threatened. They're being canceled. Um, you may have even come across a really excellent priest and he gets silenced by his superiors. For some reason, and this is kind of probably covered, I'd say, from infiltration in my book review on that, they're being canceled because of the fact that they're speaking the truth and they're preaching what the Catholic Church always used to preach, except for nowadays they're getting silenced. Um, Champions of the Faith, he, he does a really good job on that one too. He goes back and he highlights various champions in the faith. Um, let's see here. For instance, St. Athanasius of Alexandria. Um, if you haven't read it yet, I highly recommend 
the apostasy that wasn't. I haven't done a book review on that because I read that book before I ever started doing these reviews. It is so good. It's about the Arian heresy and how Athanasius stood up to Arius and fought down that heresy. I mean, he fought for a long time. He became a bishop and he kept getting exiled. Even though he was right, he kept getting exiled. Even the Pope at one time wavered on him. I think it's St. Jerome who has a quote about how the world groaned and found itself Arian. And he persevered hard in defending Jesus' divinity and the Holy Trinity. Um, he even has the Athanasius Creed in this book, which I don't think I'd ever actually seen it before. But it's really good, so it's definitely worth reading um, the creed there. I mean, it's, it's awesome and it's right. He talks about St. Augustine in here, um, St. Irenaeus, and then he talks about um, St. Robert Bellarmine. He talks about St. Robert Bellarmine, who was a... St. Robert Bellarmine was phenomenal. He was like truly the embodiment of, of a bishop who knew what his job was and he did it well, even sometimes to his own expense. He talks about the various heretics that he battled, such as John Calvin, and he talks about St. Vincent de Sales here, which if you haven't read about him yet, I do highly recommend it. I actually have a book by him on the devout life, which is good. I've only made it a few chapters in, so I haven't really had a chance to finish it and do a review on that one. But St. Vincent de Sales, he would write out little tracks, travel at night, slipping these tracks under people's doors. He would sleep in trees, walking, you know, after walking in the snow, delivering these tracks, and he fought back Calvinism and converted many people back to Catholicism. Then there's St. Thomas Aquinas, Archbishop Fulton Sheen. In fact, Archbishop Fulton Sheen has a famous quote, which you might have already heard. Who's going to save our church? It's not our bishops. It's not our priests, and it's not the religious. It's up to you, the people. You have the minds, the eyes, and the ears to save the church. Your mission is to see that the priests act like priests, your bishops act like bishops, and the religious act like religious. I mean, that's what it comes down to. Learn your faith, know your faith, and don't expect to be taught your faith by the priests or bishops. Pursue it and learn it on your own, and then call the priest to task politely charitably and love the column to task when they do wrong and that's the chapter that he wraps the book up with is our heroes in the faith and you got it right there from Fulton Sheen he recognized the fact of who it was that was going to save the church um, this book is very similar in a way to Ralph Martin's book but it's different it has the same target the same concept but a lot of his focus is different from that in Ralph Martin's book. So I highly recommend reading this book because you're gonna learn a lot from it, particularly the chapters about Catholic no-nos because I know a lot of people that I come across that don't know that there are these things that they're doing that are wrong, that are not part of the Catholic faith and they may even say, oh, well, it's okay because my priest said it's okay or oh, well, they do it at the church. That doesn't make it okay. Find a holy priest. The Holy Spirit's going to, to, to ping you. If, if what you're being told is, oh, it's okay, and it's not really okay, you're not going to get that complete peace. And just because you're, it's being instructed at a church doesn't mean it's okay either because, think about it, infiltration. The church has been infiltrated. And those who have infiltrated will lead you astray because that's their goal. Some of them like being led astray. Some of them don't even realize that they've been led astray, but they're going to lead others astray as a result. So, highly recommend this book, Restoring Our Catholic Identity by Paul Nelson. Um, go get a copy. It's not a terribly long read. It's actually very quick and concise. It's got personality. That's one of the things I love about a book is when you can hear the author's voice talking to you. You can hear their personality coming through. Um, it's not a dry read, which... There are some good books out there that have a lot of information and they're just dry. Not a dry book. In fact, the last several books I've read are not dry books. So I highly recommend it. Get this book. Give it a read. You'll probably learn a lot from it. I mean, even when there's stuff in a book that I know, I still find that, like in this book, there's so much I actually didn't know and I learned a lot from it. There were things I already knew and it just sort of confirmed for me what I already knew, which... It was nice, I mean, to see that there's someone else who sees the same things going on that I do. 
Um, so if you haven't yet, please click the subscribe button, click the like button, share this video if you liked it so that other people will know that, you know, there's this good video out there with a book review on a very good book. And I will see you in my next video.